Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence comes from my guest. And in this case, it's David Gessner, a well-known, I don't want to say nature writer, but he discusses that in his book. I, I know, because he feels that somehow trivializes it. Uh, but he's written a dozen books, best-selling books, very famous uh, guy, uh, wandered all around. Uh, natural national parks and everything. But this book has an urgency to it. It's called A Traveler's Guide, not that the others didn't, but a particular urgency, A Traveler's Guide to the End of the World. That's pretty urgent. Uh, Tales of Fire, Wind, and Water, uh, Tory House Press. Now, he wrote this uh, two years ago, basically, or uh, but and in it, he describes a uh, a situation where he's addressing his college age daughter. I think she was 21 at the time. And uh, what, what will the world be like when she is his age, which I guess is now 61, 62, that would be in the year 2062. And the challenge, the, the good thing about this book, by the way, let me make it very clear. It's a very readable book. And it's not depressing. I have to tell people that every time we talk about certainly the the end of the world could be uh, very depressing. Nor does he want to offer some simplistic hope notion. He resents that. So we're dealing with complexity and reality here. Nonetheless, uh, it's pretty depressing, I have to say. Not the writing, but the the prognosis. You just said it wasn't depressing. Okay, yeah. (laughs) I know. I mean, it's it's interesting to read, including your own home there, I guess, in North Carolina, where you were bullseye for an oncoming uh, hurricane. And we all have this. You talk about Paradise, California. I'm in Southern California, but not that far away where, you know, the destruction of a town. And your, your book is really Uh, aimed at America. It's a journey across America. But of course, the worldwide implications are are enormous. So why don't I just leave it to you before I keep babbling here and tell me what you set out to do. And uh, I can only say as a reader, you certainly succeeded in alarming me, but go on. Well, I think you put it really well. I mean, I I didn't want to fall fall prey to the cliches of the genre, which are pretty well established at this point. I call them the tropes of hope. Either, you know, you see a newscast where the newscaster says, oh, the ice cap is melting, but look, we have this little solar device, so let's be hopeful. Um, you have that on the other end of the, you have the apocalyptic screeds like Old Testament prophets, right? Jeremiah is coming at you saying, we're going to die right now. and. So I wanted to find a way to write about it as literature, you know, as as not um, not as a bullet point list, not as a hope booyer, but as saying what was and imagining what would be. You know, you don't read um, Dostoevsky and then go, oh, here's some bullet points. You know, don't be depressed. Don't you know you. you so I, I want to kind of help climate change into a new literary age. And you mentioned the title. There's a little bit of a wink mockery in the title as well. I had an earlier book called My Green Manifesto, where I basically made fun of all these, the end of, the doom of, the, you know, the death of titles that are, you know, that's how you get attention, right? You say, we're all doomed. And so for me, there was an aspect where I don't really think it's the end of the world. But I do think that um, it's startling if you get out of your home and start to travel, which I did a year into the pandemic. And everywhere I went, there was a flash flood here, a hurricane there, a fire there. And I was like, should we maybe stop thinking of this as a warning, something off in the future and think it's here, here we are in it. And all I wanted to do kind of was to bear witness. And, you know, I say at the beginning, there are aspects of the book that are kind of fun. I go into diners and talk to people. I talk to everybody I run into. Um, I, and that's not supposed to be what a climate book is. It's supposed to be policy. Um, I quote Maya Angelou, who says, you know, a bird doesn't sing because it has an answer. It sings because it has a song. So what is the song? 
Well, the song is a description of what I'm seeing in the world right now. And what I'm seeing, you know, whether we want to bicker and argue about, you know, with, with, with still having climate deniers, is climate change already in full flower, you know, in many places, particularly in the desert southwest and on the coast where I live in North Carolina, where the hurricanes are coming fast and furious. So we know, okay, I'm, I'm going to l- save us a lot of trouble. We're not, we don't care about climate deniers. That's another right, discussion. Right. I don't okay. it, It's yeah. very obvious that <laughs> that stuff is going on and it's alarming and, exactly. and, and, you know, the disappearance of coastal communities and everything else. Uh, I really would rather get to in these diners and everything, the discussion of what you can do about it, because it seems to me, well, let me start with something provocative. One of the you've got really great blurbs from this book for this book from uh, really important people uh, and respect your work as they should. And one of them is Jamie Raskin, who got, was well known because he was involved in the impeachment proceedings. He's a very famous lawyer and so forth. And uh, he praises your book. And and yet, as a congressman, and you look at Congress right now. You look at the world right now, and we're doing a lot of stuff, including this whole question of the Ukraine and now getting Europe to have more weapons and so forth, which seem to be on the path of greater destruction and dependence, actually, upon fossil fuels, because after all, you have all these weapons systems and, and so forth. And I just wonder about the disconnect. People admire your work. And yet in their lives, and I don't know, I don't want to pick on Jamie Raskin, but the fact is in the work of Congress, they're really paying very little attention to these destructive forces right now. We're still going on with business as usual. And indeed, the drums of war are are beating uh, louder than, than they have for some time. Okay, I've got a few different takes on that. One... One is, uh, I Jamie wrote me a note in the uh, one night and said he had insomnia and read the whole book. So I I was delighted to get that note, and I think if he weren't busy saving democracy, he actually does care about environmental issues like Sligo Creek in his district. Um, but he's got he's got some bigger fish to fry right now. <laughs> right. Well, well that isn't that the problem? There's always bigger fish to fry. And yet, uh, to take the title of your book, The End of the World, and we're running out of time, why isn't that the biggest fish? Well, that's a great question. Because as we've discussed, you know, you know, as I'm sure you've heard, there's a, there's a, like, human evolution, uh, where we're not really built to think and imagine to that 2060 date when Hadley's going to be my age, when my daughter's going to be my age. And one of the things I'm trying to do with the book is get people to imagine, to have empathy, which I don't think I'll succeed at, by the way. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm a skeptical person, right? But at least I'm going to try to say, think of what you're doing. You know, this is almost an environmental trope. Roosevelt said it at the edge of the Grand Canyon, your children's children's children. But we can't get that through our thick, you know, human skulls, right? We, we're not. We're, we're worried about what our job is today. We're worried about what we're going to get for lunch. And that inability is frustrating. So I'm going to push back. You push back on me a little. I'm going to push back on you and say, I don't make claims. I mean, one of the big problems for me is just general arrogance in what we're dealing with, even the arrogance of those who think they can predict the future. Um, and to me, I would be arrogant to think I can make specific policy suggestions. My job as an artist, I feel like, is to present it. Now, hopefully somebody's going to read it. Like, for instance, my daughter seems to have the activism gene that I don't have. And she reads it and gets fired up and gives speeches at school and things like that. Um, I'm just a sloppy old writer, and I just put the put down what I see. So I'm, I'm maybe not the best person on the policy end. But I will say this, there's a really good book called Ministry for the Future 
I don't know if you you've seen it, but it's right back here. It's by uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, and it's a big. It's called Cli Fi. It's a big Cli Fi novel, climate fiction, and in it, it's dismally depressing for about forty years. And when things finally begin to turn, and granted it's fiction, it's because uh, people do what they can do. For instance, the writers write, the politicians finally reluctantly legislate, the monkey wrenchers monkey wrench, the lawyers sue, um, and it's, it's this gradual kind of awakening. Uh, I hope to God it's not that gradual for us, but I can't help but think it might be. You know, we, we like you said, we have this thing, this giant uh, problem in front of us, and we spend no time uh, doing it. So I guess if there's a message to the book, it's please wake up. You know, it's like I try to slap people in the face and say, can't you see that this is bigger than uh, balancing the budget, for instance? Uh, but but do you do you know, but we're you know, we're both we've lived a little while. Um, do we think we're going to get people to, to do that? I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing my part to present it. Um, will people listen? Uh, I don't know. Well, but do, <laughs> let, let's talk about the actual prediction. Are we talking about the end of the world? No, we're not talking about the end of the world. We're talking about the end of human life as we, as we're living it right now at the, at this kind of rapacious consumer like uh, level and, and speed. Uh, so we're talking about the end of that. Uh, and we're really probably more frightening since we have some sort of anthropocentric view, you know, human, human, human. We're talking about the, the wiping out of species as we go as well, which is going at a, a clip that is horrifying. Um, so, you know, we're talking about a hotter world, obviously. We're talking about a more erratic world. We're talking about a world where, you know, one thing people don't talk about is air. One of my earlier, you know, I, I gave creative writing assignments to scientists. I said, please write up a little something. And uh, Caltech's Paul Weinberg was one of the first to come back. And he, he compared it to um, when, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, I think it's the, the volcano that uh, Mount Pinatuba in 1991, after that, there were deep uh, purples and reds of sunsets all over the coast. And he predicted future sunsets like that when Hadley's my age and, and the air would thick with particulates and, and, you know, already 7 million people a year die of um, air pollution. And that number is going to go up and up if, if we keep going the way we are. So there are, you know, and obviously sea level rise, uh, increasing intensity of storms, um, scarcity of resources, uh, things ish, things like what we saw in New Orleans after Katrina, people massively leaving. Unfortunately, they left and went to Texas where they were soon hit with the next hurricane and, and flooding. So, you know, the, the things we already know are probably going to happen. Uh, so that's not the end of the world. It's the end of our current world and, uh, and a deep unsettling, which coupled with political unsettling, which, of course, we're in the midst of, uh, is pretty frightening, right? So, um, and by the way, if you could speak a little louder, I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the volume. Um, let, me, let me take this, okay, let's take this question of the quality of air that we breathe and so forth. And your book is, is basically a, a journey through America, uh, but, uh, and, and America is very important because we consume this world you talk about consumption and so forth we've been the pioneers certainly in the post-war period of excessive consumption i remember uh, uh, decades back in the early 60s when you had the population bomb ehrlich and people like that the u.s which i think then they said we were six percent of the population of the world and we were using 60 percent of its resources and so forth now we have a lot of competition out there so it's not quite as stacked but one place where there's really been a big problem with the quality of air and it's a worldwide problem uh is china we're in Beijing and so forth. You have difficulty breathing. Now, they, uh, I thought, 
sort of was optimistic that they seem to be swinging heavily towards electric autos, and that may not be the ultimate solution, but at least you can uh, push the pollution somewhere else and not in your major cities. And I, I thought that was positive, but yet now we're at the same moment almost talking about maybe a war with China. And, uh, you know, and, and, and then there's a fear, maybe their population has declined. Will that mean that they're not going to do well? Well, we used to think population decline was a good thing. Now it's presented as an alarming thing somehow. I'm just wondering about two old guys here. I'm much older than you, but it's kind of the discussion takes this irresponsible route always. It's like we have the alarm of the population bomb of Ehrlich. We've right. known about some of these problems for a, a long time. And then we actually can sit and chat and say, well, they really aren't going to do very much, or will they? And I just wonder about that disconnect, you know, and, and maybe you could discuss that. You've talked to people in the diners. You've been all over the country. Yeah. And so let's say Paradise, California, hard hit, or, you know, your hurricane area. Do people the morning after then say, yes, let's do something about it? Or do they go about their business? My experience has been they go about their business and that, you know, it's I live in Wilmington. So you get the Wilmington Strong posters and you get Paradise Strong and everybody starts talking about rebuilding and commerce quickly. Like things have barely shattered and broken and then they're t the talk is of rebuilding for me. Uh, again, this may not be, you know, we might have a little disconnect here in that I try, I'm trying to write a book that doesn't provide the bullet point political answers. And for me, the enemy often is arrogance and ignorance. And what I found, I didn't find much hopeful, but what gave me hope were the incidents like with Ryan Lambert in Louisiana, where he, a very conservative hunter fisherman is working to redirect the Mississippi and rebuild land in the, you know, in, down below New Orleans in, in Barataria Bay. And he says, look, the doctor is right there, the Mississippi and the patient, the bay is right here, and I'm going to bring them together. And he literally is building land. And he says, nature is so resilient. Now, these are just little incidents, and I know they don't add up to saving the world. But for me, for instance, standing, straddling the Colorado River at, at its source, where it's about two feet wide, and realizing nature is the source of this water that gives 40 million people in the West uh, their water, the Colorado. To me, there's a disconnect. The real disconnect is between knowing that we're animals in a habitat, just like, you know, mountain lions are and birds are, and that we're despoiling our habitat that we're in. And when I feel connected, you know, uh, to a more elemental life, to wind, water, to, uh, to birds, to animals, I can be, if not hopeful, just kind of feel like more connected to the world where we're getting our, getting things to, we're getting things from these world, this world that we're destroying. And to me, when we see things like paradise and the hurricane, we're, it's, I wouldn't go as far as, I'm not like an Old Testament prophet. I'm not going to say we feel the wrath of nature. But, um, but it's just interesting to me that both the solution and the problem are in this world that many of us just completely ignore. I mean, we live in a time where the virtual is king, right? And what I'm talking about is the actual and the elemental. So it's not exactly a political answer, and I apologize for that. And I do say in the preface that my knowledge is walking and traveling across this country. You can extrapolate to the world, you know, uh, and but my knowledge is, is weak when it comes to the, the larger world. And I'm just focusing on kind of the micro and what I see as I, as I go. And also on my daughter's kind of mindset, it's really interesting to me that it's an active part of her imagining. And it is for many people. Uh, the Lancet, the medical journey, journal, did a study of 10,000 kids from 20 countries. And the vast majority said that climate anxiety is part of their, their life. 
climate anxiety is real to them in the way it may not be to you and me. You know, we we didn't grow up with it. And so to me, it's like empathizing with the people of the future and trying to think what what are the solutions? Of course, they're political solutions. Of course, they're, you know, alternative energy and not consuming as much. But I also think it's a disconnect from the actual world, from the physical world. And for me, the most hopeful parts of the book, when I was on the Mississippi, when I was straddling the Colorado, when I was talking to people on the beaches after the hurricanes. And uh, and so I, I don't think I can offer what people want, but that's what I got out of my trip. Okay. So, and, and I, I respect that. And I think... Um, and you, I think you're absolutely right about the generational difference. I teach at a college as well, and and there's no question that a whole generation now gets it. At the same time, at the same time, we have eighty year olds running for office against each other. Yeah. Well, <laughs> aside from that, uh, there also this phrase you used before about the consumerist culture, these same young people are subject to the same kind of advertising and consumption and get yours and buy, buy, buy. Yeah. And isn't that, I mean, yes, even older people can be thoughtful in the middle of, or facing a hurricane or in in this community of paradise we haven't really identified in California that was visited with, you know, the horrible things that happened from from climate change, uh, but what works against? Do, well, let's let's talk about your tension with your daughter. I mean, I'm not saying you have a personal tension. This healthy tension that is in your book. Uh, how do we preserve the idealism and innocence, if it is, or the uh, clarity of your daughter? in a world that will do its best to obliterate that clarity by consumption and want and right. I mean, the the culture, how do you, how do you preserve that? How do you enhance it? How do we have more like your daughter and fewer people like us? Uh, That's a good question. I think, unfortunately, we have an acceleration of disaster. You know, I think that the times there have been some responses. Um, I mean, Katrina was an eye opener, right? Um, Sandy was another one, bringing it right to New York City. Um, I think a good media center hurricane will help. <laughs> for, for for a matter of days or weeks. For a matter of days, though, there was there was some reclaiming of 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 land, and there was an attempt to say we're not going to rebuild and there and there have been a few instances like that if uh there's a famous storm that hit topsail not uh topsail island not long before i got here and they were getting the barely getting the words topsail strong out when the second storm hit and you know that's an indicator that um, you can't rebuild on the train tracks as my friend orrin pilkey the duke coastal geologist said when we traveled through new york Um, So there are going to be more wake-up calls, right? On the other hand, uh, of course, people who deny, and we're not talking about the deniers, um, are are going to point out that we just had the snowiest winter in the West since I graduated from college. And those, uh, the drought, it's, I was just out there uh, walking through a couple feet of snow in May. And, uh, and we're going to have some nice, water this summer. It'll be a green summer. But of course, that doesn't stop the, the overall uh, trend toward, toward drought. So I don't know. I don't know how we do that. Maybe there will be people of that generation who recognize it as the issue it is. Though a Gallup poll recently said that 3% of people think it's the most important issue we face. Well, and so. you know, that that is the the problem is, uh, you know, let's take the drought, you know, because I, I live in California. And we've been hearing about the drought. And then you have these people doing farming and a lot of it industrial farming. And some of the planting like 
walnuts or somebody something that's brought up how much water it takes to grow walnuts uh, or almonds almonds a bit better example uh, really than walnuts sorry and and yet now this summer everybody's going to think hey let's go and and continue with this kind of agriculture. And in your book, you talk about this phenomena of rebuilding. Uh, you know, disaster happens, cliffs collapse, and then people want to build on the same cliff. You know, uh, let's just, oh, let's roll up our sleeves. And these slogans you mentioned where you're living or in paradise, you know, what, build back better or something. Uh, right. uh, how do you deal with that? Well, I have a question. How are you going to deal with it? Because there's so much snow that you can get ready for some flooding where you are. You know, it's going to, I mean, it's, that's what we're getting is this moving between extremes, right? So I live in a place where every summer around August 1st, we get anxious because uh, we know what's coming. The season is coming just as in California and other parts of the West, the fire season is coming. The problem with the fire season, of course, is that it's expanded to include the whole year, um, at least in drier years, not this year. Uh, for instance, Colorado had its most destructive fire the last day of the year, um, the year I was traveling, right? You know, and New Year's Day was, was things were burning. But there's this anxiety about um, that's understood, that, that becomes kind of part of the yearly cycle. Uh, and I think in the Northeast, they're going to start having that more as, as the hurricane season expands. Uh, how do I deal with it? Pretty much like everybody else. I, um, I put on blinders and then uh, when it comes, the blinders come off, but uh, pretty quickly, um, you know, I have my teaching to do and my job to do and my writing to do. I'm no, I'm no better than anybody else. Uh, it's, it's uh, maybe we need a visionary. Well, maybe let me I, ask you. About, I'm not uh, a visionary. Uh, maybe we need one. <laughs> let me talk. Uh, just end then, if we could wrap it up with a visionary, because you, there is a vision in this book, and the and the vision is. You don't have to. You don't want to just scare people, and you don't want to have false hope, and you don't want to be. You've got all the book has a wonderful tone to it, of reality, and hey, you know we threw a lot of things, and there are solutions, and things can be worked out. But I want to put a little bit of an edge on that. Is it possible that the dominant world culture, uh, uh, and let me sound like a a preacher here, the dominant world culture of consumption, the stress on advertising, because the places you like, the natural, uh, that your other books are about protecting, you know, areas of, where we can keep the earth as it once was, where you can protect wildlife and so forth. All of that basically requires a limit on the on consumption, the ex excess, and the constant pushing of consumption. And, and I just, uh, let me ask you to take a stab at that. How, because what will happen, I, I don't want to be pessimistic here, but generally we have these younger people who get it, and then they will be uh, marketed to <laughs> with an intensity of, you must have more of this and that and that and that. And isn't that really the big enemy worldwide? I'm not just blaming now the United States, although we were the center of much of that consumption frenzy. Isn't that the real tension? I Are you going to walk in Roosevelt's, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's natural preserve and say, keep it this way? No. Or are you going to subdivide it and build bigger houses? Why don't no, we end I mean with that? I think that, you know, the patron saint of my tribe, Mr. Thoreau, uh, was saying back, you know, in the mid-1800s mid uh, that limits and restraint uh, are, are the key here. And it's just not, um, it's just not a consumer culture where excess is uh, celebrated, right? I mean, it's how are we going to make holding back and not doing as much as valued as gobbling up and doing more. And that 
is a huge challenge. I mean, we have, we've done it at certain times in war, right? And we've, uh, we've, we've managed to do it. But uh, I think there has to be an aspect of war footing. Uh, if, you know, if the tragedies and, and emergencies come fast and fur furious, I can imagine, uh, you, you, here's what I say in the book. A heron or egret doesn't stay still and quiet because it likes patience. It stays still and quiet because it wants the fish. You know, that's why it's patient. And so there has to be an urgency behind restraint and patience and these old values that isn't there now, but perhaps in the face of tragedy and emergencies uh, can be valued. Again, I grew up reading, Kurt, I, I read Thoreau, but I also read Kurt Vonnegut you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a flaming optimist. I, 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 I see it as a huge challenge that may not be met, but I know that we're, we're facing it. And I'm, I'm trying to just say, here it is, here's where we are now. And let's picture where we will be. I'll leave it to better minds than me to then go out and do something about it. <laughs> yeah. But what you, what you do accomplish what you do accomplish, the book is A Traveler's Guide to the End of the World, Tales of Fire, Wind, and Water, but it's also tales of ordinary folks who get it, who care, uh, who want to do something about it. And that is a source of optimism. And of course, no one more so, or maybe typically so of such people, is the, the your daughter and hopefully a new generation. So I want, that's it for this edition of Sheer Intelligence. I want to thank Laura Condigerian and Christopher Ho at KCRW uh, for posting these podcasts. I want to thank Diego Ramos for writing the intro, Max Jones for setting up the technique, and most of all, our executive producer, Joshua Shear and the JWK or JKW Foundation for providing funding for this. See you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence. <laughs>